Hi, this is Jay McClellan, and today I'm going to do some powder coating. I'm going to apply a powder coat to the housing of the fourth axis assembly that I made. I showed the construction of this in, uh, in a couple of previous videos where I welded up the housing out of steel and machined it and did some testing and it was able to put it to use, but uh, I didn't actually do the final finishing on it. And so in this video, I'll show you the powder coating process. Here's the equipment I use to do powder coating. I have a powder coating gun made by Eastwood Company. I have no affiliation with them. This is just the one I bought and it seems to be a pretty popular one. I bought the dual voltage gun that has a switch for either 15,000 or 25,000 volts uh, for applying the powder. And the higher voltage can be used full on larger parts, but I use it almost exclusively on the lower voltage and it works fine. It has a switch that you have to push in order to energize because the, it's not plugged in at the moment. Uh, because when you energize the tip, then you have 15 or 25,000 volts right here. And hopefully you're holding the gun with your other hand, so you don't want to be touching that tip. Uh, I have not done so yet, and I don't plan to, but I did touch it against a part that was being powder coated, and it makes quite an arc. The gun then is loaded with the, uh, with the powder. And the powder comes in jars like this in various colors. So I have this loaded up with blue powder for the part that I'm going to do today. And then it connects to an air supply. And this is one of the tricks. You need a very low pressure air supply for it. About 8 pounds per square inch or 55 kPa is ideal for this gun. And most uh, air compressor regulators will go down that far, but the gauges they have are really hard to read down at that low pressure. So I have an ordinary little pressure regulator, you can buy these quite inexpensively, that I fitted with a low pressure gauge. This only goes up to 15 PSI or 100 kPa, so it's a very low pressure, and so I can, I can see the pressure I'm setting it at much more accurately that way. Now I have an oil and water separator filter so that I could use this with an ordinary compressor, and this, this is okay. You really need dry air coming in. This is about the minimum you need, but I have this connected to my shop compressor and my central air shop compressor system has a three-stage drying unit. So it has a particulate filter, it has an oil and water separator filter uh, similar to this, and then it also has a desiccant dryer that dries the air even further. And it's a big compressor and I have that because I need it for things like plasma cutting where I need a supply, a very high volume supply, of very dry air. Works great for this, but the air supply requirements are tiny. So about the smallest compressor you can buy is perfectly adequate for powder coating. Like most finishing processes, the first step is going to be to prepare the surface. I have some uh, sandblasted surfaces on part of this, and then I have some machine surfaces that are quite smooth. And I'm going to sandblast the entire outside, all of the surfaces that I'm going to powder coat. And that'll give a good, uh, a good texture that the powder coat should adhere, adhere well to. If you watched my video on making the fourth axis assembly, you saw that I machined these mounting flanges uh, in a plane perpendicular to the main base mounting surface. And I want to be very careful that I don't disrupt those surfaces. I don't want to get any sandblasting, etching of the surfaces. I don't want to damage the threads. And I also don't want to get any powder coating on these. So I made a little uh, protector. It's just a little thin sheet of aluminum to go over those. And then I'll put in uh, some bolts as well. This is my sandblasting cabinet. It's a fairly inexpensive benchtop unit and uh, doesn't have a real huge capacity, but it's big enough for my needs. And I'll go ahead and put the part in. Inside there are gloves for my hands and the actual sandblast gun. And then I have abrasive in the bottom. And the abrasive I'm using would be considered a fine sand. It's a fine blasting sand, fairly common. And I have this connected up to my air compressor. Uh, it's set at about 90 PSI of filtered and dried air coming in here. Okay, we'll close the lid, put my hands through here, and now I'm ready to start blasting. I've got all the loose sand off, although there's a little bit still clinging to the surface. And next I'm going to clean the part not just of sand, but especially of oil. So I'm going to use acetone for that. And from this point forward, I'm going to handle the part only with gloves. These are powder-free nitrile gloves. So they'll protect my hands, but they'll also keep any uh, skin oils from getting on the part because I want it clean, clean, clean from now on. 
So this is what's coming off. There may be a little bit of residue from the sand uh, powder. A lot of this is just oil residue from when I machined it because I, I cleaned it only lightly thereafter. I got the surface pretty well cleaned now. I wiped everything down with acetone, including the back and the bottom and even the inside. The surfaces I'm not gonna powder coat. I wanna get as much oil out of the process as possible. The next step is I still have some oil inside the part and down in the crevices from where I machined it and I need to bake that out because otherwise it's gonna bake out when I'm trying to cure the powder coating and that's gonna make a mess. Powder coating needs to be cured at a temperature of around 450 degrees Fahrenheit or 230 degrees Celsius. And so you need an oven to cure it. You do not need something as fancy as what I have. You can get by with just a plain old toaster oven or an oven made for food. You just need to make sure that it's not ever going to be used for food thereafter because inevitably some of the powder will fall off into the oven and you don't want that contaminating food stuff. So you do need a dedicated device for curing it. I'm going to use this powdery kiln. It's one I've had for many, many, many years and uh, it has this primitive pyrometer to indicate temperature with a thermocouple inside. So I made a connector here and wired that into this controller box with a PID temperature controller and a solid state relay. This is sort of a deluxe curing oven. Uh, but by doing it this way, I can use it for other things. I can use it for heat treating metal or other types of uh, pottery, fused glass, etc. So it's really handy having a digital temperature controller for it. I have the temperature controller set at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 260 degrees Celsius. And that's about 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees Celsius above the hottest temperature where I'm going to cook the powder coating itself. This is a good time to practice loading the oven because my part is rather heavy, and when I've powder coated it, it's gonna be very important not to touch it to the edges or sides of the kiln, and I need to be able to put it in smoothly without disrupting the powder when I bake it for real. Before I started this, I used compressed air to blow all of the dust out of the oven so it's nice and clean. I've got my part sitting up on a little trivet. Uh, I'm gonna bake it at 500 degrees, let it cool down, and then I'll prepare it for the powder coating after that. My part has been baking for about 15 minutes and I'll open the kiln just briefly to have a look at it. Quite a bit of smoke coming off. So there's still a lot of oil left to, uh, left to burn out. So it's now been another 15 minutes and we'll check it again. Quite a lot of smoke in there, so I'd say it's not done yet. We'll keep cooking. Well, I had to cook this thing for three hours before the smoke stopped coming out. And obviously it's heavily oxidized, so I'll have to uh, sandblast it again to clean up back down to bare metal. But what I want to point out is you can see the especially dark areas in here, and I'm being careful, I have not touched this with my hands. Uh, I'm going to be touching it only with gloves, but you see the dark areas right here. That's where oil was oozing out of these seams during the baking. And uh, so oil was trapped in between the pieces of metal and uh, the heat causes that oil to move outward. You can imagine what would happen if that occurred while I was trying to cure a powder coating. Oil coming out underneath the powder coating film would just totally ruin the whole thing. Off camera, I took the part back to the sandblaster and cleaned off all the oxidation uh, from the baking. And I think it came out looking pretty good. I repeated my treatment of wiping it all down with acetone. Uh, so I have a nice clean surface and then on the back and the bottom, I, uh, I masked it off with this green polyester high temperature masking tape because I don't want to put powder coating on, on the back or on the bottom surfaces. And then I also masked it off on the front so I don't get any uh, powder coating inside the unit and especially not on those uh, mating surfaces. When I did the bottom, the center section is aluminum foil rather than tape. I wanted to have a good uh, conductive path for the grounding clip of the powder coating unit, which is clipped to the grid that this is sitting on. And uh, so it's got a good electrical path through the aluminum foil to the metal. Honestly, this is 15,000 volt potential. It's very unlikely that this thin layer of tape would act as much of an insulator at that, uh, at that voltage. But still, no point in having an insulator when we can have a good conductor. So it's all ready to powder coat. And I had kind of a crazy idea to try to video, video the powder coating so that you can actually see the powder going on. And so I've got some side lighting set up and a black background. I have the powder coating gun set at 15,000 volts 
And so, with any luck, when I push the button and uh, pull the trigger, we'll get some powder co coating. So that first pass looked pretty good. I've got uh, not a completely even coat yet, but uh, the sections that were coated on this side look pretty good, so I'm going to rotate it around a little bit. And then we'll hit it from the side. You won't be able to see this quite as well. So that looks pretty good. Down in these corners, it tends not to coat as well. There's uh, somewhat of a, it's called a Faraday cage effect, where the electrostatic charge is effectively weaker in those gaps. But I'm not too worried about those areas. They're going to get uh, abraded by fasteners anyway. Okay, here goes a pass on the other side. That looks pretty good. Again, a little bit of gaps in coverage, so I'll rotate it around a little bit and hit it from a different angle. You can see I'm getting poor coverage on the front right there, and the reason is that my metal grate that I'm supporting this on is sticking out in front, and uh, that's attracting the powder actually away from the part. So I'm going to try to move the part a little bit without making a mess of the whole thing. Now I moved the camera a little bit, and so we can see the area where it didn't coat very well, and I just slid it forward on the grate. So with that grate out of the way, we should get a much better coating in that area. I can see some thin area around this weld. Again, it's kind of in a corner, so that's going to be a little bit of a difficult spot, but I'll try to get a little bit better coverage down in there. I think it looks good. I'm going to give it just one more light overall mist, and then we'll call that good. So I have my oven preheated to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 230 Celsius. So I'm ready to put it in. I set up a bright light source so that we should be able to see the part getting shiny as the powder coating starts to fuse. The part's been baking for 10 minutes now, so let's open it up and have a look. That's just about fully fused all the way around. I'm looking on the top. You can't see it real well from the camera angle. So now I'll turn the oven down to 400 degrees Fahrenheit or approximately 200 degrees Celsius. I let it bake for another 20 minutes and then shut it off and let it cool overnight. You don't need to wait that long, but uh, I, you do want to wait long enough that you're not taking it out while the coating is still liquid. And I'm being very careful as I remove the part not to touch it yet, because if there's a problem in the coating, I could still recoat it and uh, bake it again if I haven't contaminated the surface. Well, I think it came out really good. Um, I've got a nice even coating all the way around along this edge where I had some problems with oil coming out as I baked it initially. I've got a nice clean finish here, so I was able to bake it out sufficiently. That was the main area I was concerned about. Every place else looks really good too, so I'm happy with this. Well, here's the finished product. I reassembled my fourth axis drive unit into its shiny new blue powder coated housing, and I think it looks pretty good. It's a good match for the blue color of my CNC router. So it's color coordinated and the powder coating will give it some protection too. I hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.